Well, we just got to Coldwater Pond Nursery and we're here with Ted. And this is a really lovely part of the Finger Lakes. I've never been this far north. And it's just uh -huh. such an idyllic drive over. I mean, it it's, it could put you to sleep on the highway, but. <laughs> 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 but the farmland here is really beautiful and you're kind of like tucked away here. Ted at the Ithaca Farmers Market. You oh. were familiar with the land that we were on. And what's nice about it is being able to get trees that are, and shrubs that are grown in your region that for are sure. like primed for your weather patterns, even though you're warmer up here now that I feel like it. <laughs> <laughs> but just tell me a little bit about what you do and what we're about to see. Sure. We're a propagation nursery, woody plant propagation and we specialize in rare and unusual trees and shrubs. And so we like to do things that you can't find at just any nursery or garden center. We do wholesale and retail. Most of our wholesale work is custom propagating for other nurseries. And then the retail side is primarily offsite at farmer's markets, pop-up sales, um, festivals, things like that. And when you talk about rare and unusual, what is that? what does that mean to you? Something that maybe is a little more difficult to propagate or that for just one reason or another doesn't really show up on every garden tour or in the garden center. Yeah. Um, something about it makes it a little more special and that kind of a thing. Keeps it into a niche that we fall into. Should we go see some of the plants? Yeah, for yeah. sure. Let's take a walk. And then how did you get involved in this yourself? I'm third generation. So I grew up on my family's nursery in New Jersey. Uh, my father's still there. He does a little bit of nursery work. He's kind of starting to semi-retire, I guess yeah. you could say. And I moved up here 30 years ago now and started this nursery here. We've been here ever since. That's great. And then did he specialize also in rare and unusual? No. Or how did you... um, he was kind of a general purpose, a uh, little bit of everything and landscaping and stuff like that. The yeah. rare plant thing was kind of something that I found was what I really like to do. And yeah. Just kind of fell into it. Very cool. Yeah. And so you do a lot of like Acer palmatums and things like that, I see. Yeah, Japanese maples are our number one crop. Um, not so much in the larger sizes because we mostly sell them as one and two year old grass. Oh yeah, you have some but... really large sizes <laughs> <Yeah>. here. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Yeah. But we do a lot of maples, probably graft to 15,000 a year of them. Mm -hmm. Most of them go to other nurseries and then we grow on what uh, stays here, leftovers. So we can take a walk in here. These yeah. houses are our growing houses where we have the finished stock. And later on, we'll see some of the propagation houses. So how do you decide what you're going to take to market? Because obviously you can't take the whole load. So <laughs> you just yeah. like cherry pick a little, yeah. little bits of everything. And... If it looks good, it goes on the truck. Really? So we just pull the tractor and the wagon out here. We'll start this afternoon pulling for the Ithaca plant sale for Friday. And I just grab whatever looks good. And I tell the my helpers, if it catches your eye, it'll yeah. catch somebody else's eye. So on the truck it goes. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And well, uh, you know, basically today is also a shopping day because I'm gonna try not to get too distracted, but um, we are shopping for the land <laughs> and you'll be bringing some of the, the trees over to us. So that, yeah. that's really helpful because then I, I won't have to like, I want that one in right. the, the Ithaca Farmer's Market. Kind. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Trying to stuff that in your car would be a little tough. Yeah, that would be a little precarious. It would be that one and nothing else. Right, for sure. Yeah. Let's take a walk through. I like how you have, it's kind of a mix of everything. It's not just all Yeah, one. I like to do that on purpose. Further up in the growing areas, you'll see where we have the plants by block, blocked yeah. out by type. But where I have them on display for folks to come and look at, 
I like to mix it up and put the different textures next to each other in different colors. Yeah. And that way the plants pop. And a plant that somebody may go by and not even give a second look, all of a sudden's like, oh, hey, what's that? And oh, these are so cute. Yeah, the Fulagilas yeah. are a great little native plant. Love those flowers. Yeah, they're really nice. I'm also looking because it is May and we just planted a bunch of bulbs in our lawn and those are blooming. The rhododendrons are blooming, but pretty much, you know, we have some perennials and flocks that are starting to bloom, but not much else. So yeah. it's kind of neat. I'm like priming to see like, well, what is in bloom right now? What you else know? could we put in? Yeah, yeah for sure. Exactly. There's a lot of stuff just coming on. Of course, May yeah. is like, for the shrub world, May is like the most floriferous time. Yes. But I try to have crops that spread that out as much as possible. Mm -hmm. I'm also into like red leaved varieties of anything. Oh yeah. So Malice, the Pink Princess. It's a nice weeper, yeah. kind of a spreading weeping mm -hmm. crab apple. Of course, the purple leaf beaches. Are... Yes, which we have, is this a fountain beach? No, that's no. an upright uh, copper beach. That oh. was part of an interesting grafting project. So because we do custom grafting for nurseries and for uh, institutions, the village of Pittsford over near Rochester had a really old beech tree in their center of the village. And it was like the icon of the village. It was on the letterheads, the trucks all had the symbol of the beech tree on it and everything like that. And it got sick. It was... A beech bark disease? <laughs> it was that and yeah. it had a whole lot of problems. Oh boy. And it was probably 150, 175 years old. It was a big old tree. Yeah. And they wanted to keep the genetics going in the town because wow. it was such an important part yeah. of, the, of the town. And so they contracted us to graft and grow a hundred of them for them and they would take them back and distribute them throughout the town and the village. And so we did that. The project just ended this uh, spring. We delivered them all uh, last month. And so there was, we, of course, grafted more than 100 to make sure we had the right yeah. quantity. And so these were the, some of the leftovers that wow. we uh, had from that project. That's so a really, it's got a lot of history behind it. It's got it. a really <laughs> special story. Yeah. It does. And we, we get involved in that kind of stuff fairly often. It's kind of neat. We've done some grafting for the U.S. National Arboretum, similar idea. Yeah. They got some trees that are really old in the collection. They want to make sure they continue. And, and when, when you're actually, you know, grafting onto a specific, like, rootstock, um, you know, oftentimes, like, we see with some of our grafted trees in the landscape, they start to get these stump sprouts. Mm -hmm. Do you constantly have to just take those off or what would you recommend? You do and it's important to get them off as soon as you can before they get diameter because then every time you have a bigger wound it creates callus tissue. The callus tissue can differentiate into another bud and create another rootstock sucker. Mm. So the smaller they are when you take them off and the quicker you can get them off the less of them you'll have down the road. Yeah. Some plants are just prone to it no matter what you do. And then wh why is uh, why are some more prone to it than others and is there anything that you would do to recommend to mm -hmm. be a bit more preventative with that measure? It really comes down to the propagation nursery doing a good job selecting the appropriate rootstock. I see. Um, one of the worst tends to be crab apples. Yes, and we see our crab apples, oh we see gosh, them, yeah. terrible. Yeah. There are two ways around that. One is to produce the crab apples as cuttings and they call it own root uh, crab apples. Mm -hmm. And that totally eliminates the problem because there is no rootstock, there's yeah. no suckers. And then the other way is there are some new, uh, some breeding occurred to create some rootstocks that they call sprout free. Oh. And they'll graft the crabs onto the sprout free rootstocks and they have a much lower incidence of that suckering. Fascinating. And um, so the better nurseries are doing that. Yeah. Kind of work that way. Yeah. I didn't even realize that there is so much still so much innovation when it comes to grafting things. Very much so. Yeah. Um, especially on the fruit side, but a little bit on the ornamental side too. Hmm. But the fruit side, that's a very in, intense breeding is still going on to this day with rootstocks for that. It's right right here in Geneva. This looks like it's sold. Is this a crab apple as well? This or? is a katsura tree. Oh, this is the katsura. Yeah, so this is one called Heronswood Globe. Wow, and it's it, so beautiful. Yeah, it was discovered at Heronswood Nursery out in the West Coast, Pacific Northwest, and it's got more of a globe shape rather yeah. than the upright that the usual heron, the Katsuras have. That's gorgeous. So this is, is this like a, or the row that I'm looking at? <laughs> yeah, so here's, here's this was oh, one you had asked about, the yes. purple leaf, the rope Look fruit. at how beautiful this one is. Yeah. 
So it's German, it translates to Red Fox is its name in English. And it starts out just this deep, dark purple. And by midsummer, the leaves are a nice dark olive green. Really nice. And it's kind of a two-tone. They'll be darker on the top than they will on the bottom. It reminds me similarly to the, just the, the heart shape of a Circus canadensis, which I also really yeah. love. Yeah. And hence its scientific name, Circidophyllum. Ah, there you go. <laughs> so it's uh, meaning red bud leaves yeah. on that. Amazing. And we've got another one called strawberry where the leaves come out the color of a strawberry and they'll have a white edge and yeah. it looks just like a strawberry oh, with that little seeds. Oh, that is pretty cool. It's, I'll, have to, I'll have to see that one. Yeah, for sure. I'm glad we're coming here now because we can actually see some of the leaves. Like, cause, you know, two weeks ago, it might've looked really different. It was bare, Yeah, totally bare. It's yeah. only been the heat of the last couple of days where we're starting to see. Now these uh, are horse stuff. chestnuts, right? It is, yeah. And then I, I was wondering about this. Um, I was chatting with our friends over at the Hort Hortus Arboretum and they said during summer, it kind of gets this blight on the leaves. I mean, it comes back and bounces back. Mm -hmm. Are there any like blight free resistant ones or? There are. So that one there is Homestead maybe? Yes, Homestead. And Homestead was bred, it's a hybrid one, and it was bred for that disease resistance mm -hmm. in the leaves. And so it's pretty good. Um, some of the ruby horse chestnuts are a little better than others. And we grow one variegated one, a, a Japanese uh, horse chestnut that's been really good. Mm. And the variegation's gorgeous. Mm. Um, so there are there are selections that can get you away from that problem. Yeah, because I do find that tree to be really beautiful, and one of the ones that we had gotten in, the bumblebees are just all over it. Oh, yeah. So yeah, <laughs> it's very cool to see, and I love the structure of them. They're beautiful trees. They're tree. really beautiful. They yeah, are. they really are. So here's some of the weeping cats. Yeah, the weeping and ones some yes. over there as well. They're Oop. just really nice trees. Yeah. What I really like about the weepers is by midsummer, their leaves are green on the top and blue on the bottom. Blue? Yeah, and then they shimmer in the wind. Oh, wow. And it's, it's just a show, really. Is. And of course, the fall color is amazing on them. Do they uh, flower at all? It's, in, it's insignificant. Yeah. Um, they were in bloom. I don't know if we can see any remnants of them. It's a tiny, yeah, there's oh, yes. Here just they are. a tiny little yeah. thing that comes out. And these might have gotten a little frost on them too, so yeah. I doubt we'll see any seeds. But they set a tiny little, uh, almost like a bean pod, but very small uh, seed pod there. You don't do any seed grown stuff here, right? It's Not all... too much. Yeah. We do a little, but um, primarily we're a, what we call a cultivar driven nursery. Mm -hmm. So ours are all asexually propagated. And is this a paper bark maple in the back? It is. That's well, that was gorgeous. seed grown. Yeah. We grew them from okay. seed here from start to finish. Yeah. And um, those were seeds collected off uh, the trees at the Webster Arboretum up in Webster, nice. New York. And they've got a wonderful collection of paper bark maples there. Nice. They set good viable seed, which is hard to find on the paper barks. I was uh, chatting with Lee, and he says that you do uh, some amazing larches here. Oh yeah, yeah, we got a couple dwarfs right yeah. here. And um, that was one tree that we actually had to take out of our land, but the robin had because it, it was planted behind another tree, and I think and it was smudged in between the home and the tree, and it was just browning. So I don't think it was getting enough light. Yep. But otherwise, it was the one tree that we had one of the uh, trees that we had to take out, but I think would do well within the landscape because of the like around the ponds and wet areas sure, and stuff. Sure, sure. And these actually lose, they're deciduous, right? Deciduous conifer, correct. Yeah. Great fall color. It's like a golden yellow. Golden yellow, yeah. Yeah, really nice. And then you also specialize in a lot of conifers, right? Yeah. So um, like the Japanese maples, they're a grafted crop for us. Um, we do everything from dwarfs up to weepers, as mm -hmm. you see there up on the little trellis. Is this like a Norway spruce? It is. Yeah, yep. KCABs. And what's neat about the weeping Norway spruce, every one of them is different. They're, we can graft them all off the same tree, but each one will develop its own character as it grows. Kind of a, almost like individual people. Yeah. <laughs> it's, and that's interesting because it's a graft, right? Yeah. So, so in theory, they should all be the same, especially if we cut the scions off the same tree. Yeah, but that's right. They never are. There's, <laughs> there's these ones. We've got one further down that's got big arms on it. And another <laughs> one that's going straight up and then weeping down. 
it's just fascinating. I love that you get like so close to your work and you start to like know every single yeah. one. <laughs> I would be like, I don't really want to part with this one. Have you ever felt that oh, way? Oh, see all those cold rings out there? <laughs> <laughs> we call that our personal collection. <laughs> Other nurseries call it the hobby house. Oh. <laughs> it's a problem throughout the industry. <laughs> we'll have to go back there and see oh, what yeah, you've collected. Oh yeah, there's a lot of cool stuff uh, out there. Okay. Well, that's that's definitely on our trip then. <laughs> Indeed. So you had mentioned to me earlier that like this is kind of like, uh, you know, y your family works here basically, right? Yeah. So yeah. my mother, when you pulled in, she mm -hmm. was just up there at the top of the driveway talking with me and she works here three afternoons a week in mm -hmm. the greenhouses. And then my stepfather does the mowing and keeps the place neat and tidy. And then my partner, Ellie, she and I kind of work everything together as far as management and day-to-day yeah. -day operations. I mean, it's so amazing to see because you have quite a lot of plants here. And I think oh. if people were ever wanting to kind of get into the, the trade, which sometimes people indiscriminately do. I mean, it sounds like you're like third generation, <laughs> but some people are like, I have a lot of plants. Maybe I should start a little Yeah, nursery. right. Yeah, do it professionally. Yeah, but it, it you have, uh, you know, it's it, it feels really sophisticated. It feels really organized. People talk about the quality of your plants. <laughs> and it's amazing to see that you're doing it with such a small, tight-knit group of people. Yeah, we do have one full-time non-family employee and two part-timers, too, yeah. to help us out. But yeah. it's not a huge staff for yeah. the size of what we're doing. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. What is this now? This looks like a... So that's a dwarf pine. A, uh, is that Moseri, maybe? Let's see what we got. Oh, Globosa veritis. So it's this is like a dwarf a thick, Scots pine. It's like a thick needle, though. Very, Look at that. yeah. It's like almost flat and yep. planar. And yeah. has a nice blue-green color. It yeah. grows in a real dense pyramid. Huh. You don't never have to prune it, and it looks like it's been sheared every day wow. of its life. That's so, I'm learning so many new plants here. Because, I mean, a lot of these aren't like native plants. They're, Correct. Right? So we, we have some natives, like the viburnum. Mm -hmm. This is the uh, black haw viburnum there. Um, and we try to have enough natives so that um, the folks that do come in shop for the native plants, yeah. that we have plants for them. And oftentimes we'll have cultivars of the natives, but mm -hmm. a lot of the other plants we do have are what would be termed exotics um, for that way. What is this one with the purple black bark? This one here is one of the crabs. This one's so that's like another crab about. apple. Yeah, yeah. It might be pink princess. Again. Yeah, that's another pink yeah. princess. Yeah, I guess I'm attracted to that one because I pointed it out twice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so far. That's what happens. <laughs> well, you see, we have like we have these beautiful kind of purplish red leaved plants already planted within the landscape, and I just I feel like we just need to connect the dots with that kind of color palette, sure. right? Because it's just like. Otherwise, it's just like one or two, but yeah. then as you start, but they're kind of just spaced around and it'd be nice to kind of translate that color, mm -hmm. you know, throughout, not overdoing it or anything right. like that, but, uh, but just- a common thread throughout yeah, the exactly. landscape. Yeah, for sure. Some more horse chestnuts here with their yeah. blooms. We do um, probably a dozen different varieties of horse chestnuts. We've got one that just finished up its it's springtime show, the leaves come out bright pink. What? Yep. And uh, then it gradually changes to kind of an olive green color, but hmm. it is vibrant pink yeah. when they first come wow. out. Wow, like a fuchsia or like a, uh, like a more coral? More like a coral, coral okay. pink. Wow, yeah, I'd love yeah, to see that sure. one. I think it's, yeah, it's I know, already it's probably done. finished, it's the tallest but... one sticking up over I there. I see, okay. Um, and you can see they're already kind of a, yep. a pale green yep. color. But yeah, it's really cool. Is this like a quince in here? We'll it is. It's a flowering quince. We'll go. In, we'll go into that yeah, one because we'll it's a little bit easier house. to see. So this house here is mostly shrubs with some trees in it. Mm -hmm. We've got some of the purple leaf trees. There's some Japanese maple showing some good color yeah. right now. Yeah. Of course, more of the Pittsford copper beeches. I love that, and I love the the quince color. It's the color that really yeah that corally peach yeah. pink. We're, we just sold our last one, but we had one that was a new one for us. We yeah. just started producing called Cameo, and it has this beautiful peach uh, colored flower, and it's a dwarf. It stays kind yeah. of small. Yeah, I'm Pretty I'm neat. looking for like a little dwarf one that could go in our pollinator garden that um, uh -huh. it kind of starts out 
peach and then we go pink and then like a deeper raspberry color within that garden. Oh, and so yeah, yeah. those colors are really There's beautiful. Yeah. Close up of that. Yeah. yeah. This was another plant you had asked about, the uh, uh, low growing prunus there. Yeah. And um, it's been in bloom now, geez, this is probably its second week. Wow. And it's been quite showy. And this is just one that creeps, yeah, right? Yeah, it does. Won't get much more than 18 inches tall at the most. Maybe, maybe a little taller, but it's Do they it's produce wide. any kind of noticeable fruit? It's not really noticeable. It, yeah. it's, it does show up, but um, you gotta be looking for it. Yeah, is it good for wildlife? Oh yeah, they oh, love yeah. it. Because you know, sure. it doesn't always have to be for human consumption. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the, that's the quince, isn't that such a beautiful color? Yeah. I don't know which cultivar that is. It's one growing at my mother's house and it came into bloom after she bought the house. Yeah. And I was like, wow, I need to be doing that. <laughs> <laughs> That's phenomenal. So you didn't really give it a name or anything like no, that? No, we yeah. just call it the species name at this point. And, and how, uh, how wide and how big does that get? They get pretty good size. So that'll okay. get about eight feet tall. And if you let it, eight feet wide. Wow. It's, it's a big shrub. Yeah. I'm asking for a friend, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> we do grow some locally produced discovered plants. So this Wigilia right here mm -hmm. is called Ruby Star. And it was discovered as a chance seedling at a nursery just west of here in Palmyra. Hmm. Um, the nursery's retired now, but he had uh, a wholesale container growing nursery there. And his crop of Wigilias one year set a whole lot of seedlings and one of them popped out. and. So he started growing it, and about the time he got got it up to size, he kind of decided to retire out. Yeah. And he said, would you like to propagate this plant? I think it has merit. So yeah. we got some cuttings and gave it a try, and oh, I love it. It's yeah. got great foliage. It comes out with the really vibrant fuchsia pink flowers in about another two weeks. and. Um, then keeps that dark foliage all summer long. And how big does that typically get? Ruby Star gets about four foot by four foot yeah. or so. And then this has a really interesting leaf structure over here. Yeah, that's one of the dwarf elms. That was discovered in England in um, Hillier Nursery Garden for Jacqueline Hillier. And just growing there, nobody knew where it came from. Yeah. They didn't know its parentage. And so they named it after Jacqueline and they introduced it to the trade. It's popular in bonsai because of yeah. the small foliage. Yeah, I was going to say it looks like a bonsai plant. Yeah, yeah, it actually gets pretty big if you let it. And then so when you get something like this, do you ever patent it yourself or? I don't, mm -hmm. mainly because we're a small grower, a small nursery, and we're locked out of all the patented stuff because mm. we're not big enough to attract the patent growers to be willing to license us. I see. So I like to put out plants that we either introduce or help introduce that other small growers can take advantage of. That's very cool. And so that's what we do. We do that one. We have two wigilias and a nine bark that's uh, really sharp. Also, that was developed uh, or found in a chance garden seedling outside of Ithaca. Oh, wow. And, okay. Um, that one we found. We'd love to really see that good. because, like, I think we have a yeah, lot of nursery escapees. We'll, we'll finish through here. Oh, yeah. And Physocarpus is one of those main species growing in the landscape and obviously some of them were escapees because oh, they had red sure. leaves and yeah, yeah. some were less so red leaved. Yep, yep. And what, what are these uh, that are flowering right now? So those are another quince that uh -huh. might be Toyo Nishiki perhaps. I'll have to check yeah. it. And these are ones that are more, yes it is, one, ones that are more flowering. They don't really fruit as much. Correct. Right? Yeah. Especially if you only have one of them, there's very little cross pollination <laughs> then. But if you have multiple varieties, then you could probably uh, expect to see some more uh, fruiting occurring just right. because cross pollinating. Will right. Happen. My mom's tree is a sole tree up there. There's no others in her neighbor's place. And it like sets one a year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just throws it out Our there, you know, lo one lonely. lonely fruit. Yeah. So part of our custom propagation for other nurseries, they'll oftentimes loan us their parent plants for a while for us to build up uh, propagation material for them. And this Japanese maple and the one next to it actually belong to another nursery. They're living here for a year or two while we get grafted stock going of it, and then they'll take it back and plant it in their landscape. Wow. 
And uh, we do a fair amount of that kind of work where the nurseries, maybe will ship us a smaller one. It's too small to propagate yet. We'll grow it on. When it gets big enough, we'll start propagating it, and then all the propagules go back to them. Yeah, it's a very interesting relationship that you have there. It is. It's amazing because you start something, and then you're like, you know, I even asked about those lilacs that were cut down there, and it's like yeah. you evolve, and you kind of lean into, like, what, you know, the, the world is giving you. And sure, then the you opportunity kind of, yeah. presents itself. Mm -hmm. Our stock level this year is probably the lowest I've ever seen it in the 30 years they've been here. The demand for nursery stock is so high, we're having trouble keeping up. <laughs> I was like, either either de demand is high or you've gotten slower. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Something happened. <laughs> there was some kind of change. <laughs> so you mentioned you're getting back into lilacs. Does yeah. that become popular again? Um, sort of, in a way, I think their popularity is still about the same. The difference is a number of large key nurseries have retired or shut down throughout the country over I the see. past 15 years. Yeah. That, um, that was their specialty. And so there's holes in the market now. And so we're thinking that this might be the opportunity for us to get back into them. So we're building up our parent stock with the mm -hmm. idea that in a year or two, we'll start really propagating them in some serious numbers. Yeah. They're very difficult to propagate, though, so... What makes them challenge. difficult, is it...? They don't like to root. Okay. They, they have about a week and a half, two-week window at the most where you can stick the cuttings, which happens to be right now when <laughs> we have a million other things to do. Yeah, right on. <laughs> it's market season. Oh, you know? yeah. yeah. <laughs> I hear you. So that's part of the reason we got out of the lilacs. Um, we were into them in a big way for quite a while, yeah. and then it was just like, it was so much to do at such a short amount of time. Yeah. And, it was a relief when we got out, but now I'm like, hmm, maybe we should <laughs> jump back in. <laughs> this is when your your mom works three days a week, and it's like now. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> is this the physocarpus? That's Yeah, that's the physocarpus. Well, that is so, a really beautiful um, color. It's yeah. like burgundy. It is, and it gets darker and darker as the summer goes on. That's and gorgeous. by the end, end of summer, it is just deep, dark purple. And what we love about it, it doesn't get the powdery mildew that a lot of the purple ones get. Hmm. And uh, it was found by Debbie Lampman at Bedlam's Gardens, just north of Ithaca mm -hmm. in King Ferry. Mm -hmm. Again, a chance seedling in her garden. And she just thought, wow. this has got special merit. And so she came to us and said, would you like to propagate it? So That's we tried great. it, tested it. I was worried about the powdery mildew. When that didn't appear, it's like, this is a winner. This is so nice to see because you just have like gardeners and their observations. Yes. And they say, hey, this is something that's a little special. Right. It's really nice that they have a relationship with you that they could come and say, hey, I'd like to share this with the rest of the world. I'm not set up for it, but you are. So it's exactly. kind of, so that's neat to see. I really enjoy that. Yeah. I find it fun too, and yeah. and it's so great to just, it's a good plant, yeah. get it out there. Yeah, <laughs> go out there in the big bad world. Exactly. <laughs> so here's your, your, your bubble houses. Yeah, yeah. so they're um, double covered, air inflated uh, with polyethylene covering. This house here with its open top is our first one naturally ventilated. Mm -hmm. All our previous houses were power ventilated with fans and this one we decided between the climate change and the cost of electricity and fuels and all, we wanted to try a naturally ventilated house and see how it works. How is it working? I like it a lot. It's taking a lot more water to keep the plants hydrated. I see. I wasn't quite expecting that, but the plants, it's the best looking crop of cuttings we've ever had. This These are summer so softwood cuttings from photogenic. last year. photogenic. The colors are pretty neat. <laughs> They're very neat to see all of this. We just need to make sure we have enough water capacity to keep them hydrated yeah. for this new environment. So, and do you do like this kind of drip irrigation or how do you uh, do this it? This house right now, since we just remodeled it, is being hand watered. Okay. But we will have it set up with overhead irrigation uh, probably in the next couple of weeks or so. And when you mean hand watering, do you mean like spraying a big hose or? Yeah, like... just a okay. hose and a watering wand and yep. a water breaker on the end. We watered it this morning. It takes one person about uh, 45 minutes to an hour to do a good job and water everything in here. In total <laughs> sum, it looks beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And this house has rolling benches, so there's only one aisle, and we yeah. roll the bench side to side as needed to get in there. We get a, an additional 10 to 15 percent production space that way. Well, I'd imagine after like three generations of growing plants and everything, you start to 
figure out some <laughs> slick moves and automations that yeah. work better, you know? Little things that help out. Yeah, <laughs> indeed. We bought a potting machine a couple years ago from a nursery that retired out of Mecklenburg, just yeah. north of Ithaca there. I guess that's one of the benefits, right, when you said that there's so many different nurseries that are closing the last 15 years. You could pick up the, the remainders, yeah. you know? Sonder, look at this. Sure. It's like just like a little bubble. So it's like air between two yeah. pieces of plastic. Which kind of reminds me of when we were so in the Netherlands. Insulated. Correct, exactly. In the Netherlands, remember they did a greenhouse inside a greenhouse? Yeah. But I would be so afraid I'd poke a hole. It can be a problem. The cats, when we're working in the greenhouse in the winter grafting, if one of the cats wants to come in, they just launch themselves and they're like Velcro <laughs> onto the outside of the house. So it can be a little annoying that way because it perforates the plastic. Oh my God. I mean, having to re so like- is it constantly being inflated? Yeah, there's a fan that sucks outside oh. air and keeps the pressure constant in there. It's pretty fascinating. And then how does the snow, is it just, do they just slough off? It just off? slides off. Yeah. Um, there's no shade cloth on in the winter like you see on these houses, yeah. so they're just smooth. This one, sometimes it'll build up on the top and we'll have to pull it off because it's a Quonset style, whereas our other houses are Gothic style. Yes. And the Gothic shed a little bit. Yeah. We do have to watch out if it's a hard blowing, very heavy storm. If the snow builds up all on one side, it can push the house over. I see. But if it builds up equally on both sides, we'll let it build all the way up to six feet. Then you're gonna have like an underground yeah. kind of like greenhouse, is, which like is an like an igloo, <laughs> yeah. So um, what are in these houses? These are right our here? propagation houses. Okay. So this first one here right now has a crop of Japanese maples in it. These were grafts done this past winter in January and a little bit into February. Oh, they look far, they, they're far along. They are. Yeah. They still have their rootstock tops on them. Yeah. Then the scions are just starting to break out and grow a bit. And over time, we work through the summer, gradually removing the rootstock and letting the scion take on yeah. from there. And most of these were custom propagated for nurseries in the southeast, in Georgia and North Carolina. Kind of a specialty niche we found. The, there's not very many grafting nurseries in the eastern U.S. anymore, huh. and even fewer who will do custom work. And so we found we just stumbled into it. Yeah. That all of a sudden people are like, "Hey, I can't find a grafter anymore. Will you custom graft for us?" Yeah. It's like, "Well, yeah, I think so." And before we knew it, that was a big part of our business. My goodness. <laughs> and then, you know, since you really specialize in a lot of Japanese maples, do you have a favorite? And why would it be your favorite? Um, the one that's just leafing out in that yeah. bed there with kind of the, the beige color. Yeah, peachy. Yeah, that's um, an old one called Aka Shigetatsu Sawa. And the Aka means red. And the Shigetatsu Sawa means, uh, I think it's like snipe rising out of the swamp or Ooh. something. So it's a bird it's so, taking Yeah, flight. that's so descriptive yeah you know? it is and it's just all season long it changes color so we we have like such a like the normal like you know purpurescence or something and then this one's like copper snipe you know, <laughs> yeah, coming right, out of the right. wetland like <laughs> it's so descriptive <laughs> it is so that's that's why i put it there because that's kind of one of my favorites yeah <laughs> didn't think i'd get to meet ted's mom <laughs> we'll surprise her. Yeah. <laughs> hello. We have visitors. <laughs> this Why, is Summerine. Hi, and Sonder. How are you? It's my and mother, Clark. Barbara. <laughs> nice to meet you, Barbara. So she's working today. Not all the graphs take. So when we do our grafting, our goal is at least 80% of them to yeah. survive. Right. But some of them don't. So when they don't, then we set them aside and then we go through the rootstocks, we can give them one more try. Because maybe it was a bad sign, maybe we were having right. a bad day. So you, you call your mom to take care of That's them. Right. That's right. She's the cleanup crew. <laughs> it's so appropriate. I don't know. <laughs> right. She just can't get rid of her children. No, not her. at all. Not at all. Well, you guys do such lovely work. So, oh. yeah. It's great fun. Actually. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Theodore does all the work. <laughs> <laughs> I, That's I not true. I just hung a rat. <laughs> <laughs> Things go wrong. You're right. <laughs> Comes in and straightens up my message. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Thank you. It was very nice meeting you, Barbara. Oh, it was nice to yeah. meet you, too. <laughs> thank you for Good taking the time. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And Ellie's working further down there, my partner. Hi, Ellie. 
<laughs> She's doing the sorting on the grafts and separating the ones that failed from the ones that are taking and then cutting back the rootstocks yeah. to get them to start to grow more. These lilacs here, they're part of another special project. The International Lilac Society has um, a preservation committee and they've identified a whole lot of really rare lilacs that may only exist in one or two places in the U.S., in some oh cases, God. even the world. It smells so good, too. And they want to get them out into the world, these really rare ones. Yeah. And so they have us graft them. They'll send us the scions of select ones. We graft it, we grow them, and then we try to get them on their own roots so they're no longer grafted and then return them to the ILS where they'll distribute them to arboretums throughout the U.S. with the idea that then commercial nurseries will start to propagate them and get these plants out into the world. I mean, when I hear you talk, it sounds like such a long process oh, yeah. to get them back out into like the commercial market or to a place where people could have them. I mean, can you give me a sense of like how long like something like this would take? These are three years old at this point. Yeah. And they're wow. just to the point where they're ready to distribute out. Mm. This one smells so divine. Yeah, so the ILS Preservation Committee chairman was here last night. He about fell over when he saw that one. Apparently yeah. it's called Tiffany Blue. Yeah. And he said, there's only one of these in existence in Nebraska. It doesn't <laughs> exist anywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> he was so excited that it was still here and doing good and big enough that we can start to actually graft off of it and get some more going. When somebody's that excited, though, you have to make sure that they're not walking away in handcuffs. Well, he already the... pulled a stunt. He goes, hey, is that a customer? And I turned, I fell for it. I turned and looked. The next thing I know, he's halfway down the house with the plane. <laughs> had to watch him after that. I know those type, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> it Takes yeah. one to know one. That's, That's right, yeah, watch out. We'll be checking your pocket. It's on the way out here. <laughs> so this greenhouse has um, one and two year old grafts. So yeah. once they've completed the propagation stage, they're ready to offer for sale. Ooh, is this, come, this That's is, the horse chestnut with the variegated wow, leaves that we talked about that's earlier. That's cool. Yeah, it's called marble chip. Mm. It's stunning. It starts out copper, copper and pink. The mm -hmm. white will be pink, the green will be copper and then it changes to gradually to the green and white. Yeah. And it stays that way all summer until in the fall you pick up a little copper again. That is a nice one. And they, the leaves get huge. Yeah. They're like this big. This is a witch hazel? It is. Yeah. It's another specialty of ours. We do a lot of witch hazels and I love them. They're mm -hmm. just... We a lot do of the cool fall. cultivars. There are. Yeah. There's the fall blooming native ones and there's a lot of selections of those and then the spring blooming hybrids. Mm -hmm. They're such a neat plant. Yeah. Japanese maples, of course. Yeah. We're gonna do some experimental rooting of different things. We've got Japanese umbrella, umbrella pines. pines. Yeah. This is one we actually, unfortunately, had to take out of our landscape. It, it reached a point where I think it was at its zenith and started to go downhill. Ah, it's so, too bad. yeah, it's a nice tree. it is a really nice tree. I am uh, impressed that it was doing okay up on that mountain. Well, I don't know for how long, you know. We got there and it was looking a little like it was struggling already, yeah, so. Yeah. They're they're another long-term crop to grow yeah. them. We use these for rootstocks for grafting. Not all the cultivars can be rooted or rooted easily. Yeah. So we root the easy one and use the easy one to graft the difficult mm. ones onto it. Oh, yes. The, These are first. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, so <laughs> that's interesting. So what is happening here? Because this is the, we got one of these. Yeah. But then you have this on here. Do you yep. have to cut that off? Or? Over time. So this one is so small yet yeah. that this little guy couldn't support all these roots. Mm -hmm. And they'd become unbalanced if we totally remove the rootstock right now. Right. And they would probably perish. So we leave the small portion of the rootstock on and throughout the summer we'll keep cutting this off maybe right now i could even take off this yeah and till this gets a little bit bigger maybe about to there and then we'll totally remove the rootstock and it'll be on its own yeah i mean this is a cool we have a little globe of this so it's growing on another tree yes so but this is the a tree, the actual original tree goes up 
and then it starts to grow down below. And then you well, you grafted that grafted, onto it, yeah, right? Yeah, so oh, you, can see, the side of it, right? you can see the graft union there. It's not my prettiest graft union. Oh, man, <laughs> see, now, now he's got, like, grafting shyness after we right, said he yeah, grafted really. so well. <laughs> <laughs> so this one here, um, this is a um, canane fir rootstock from the Canaan Valley in West mm -hmm. Virginia and the Korean fir selection, the icebreaker mm -hmm. cultivar. And then we grafted it onto the Canaan fir. Mm -hmm. And then once they knit together and this is big enough, we remove the Canaan fir top and just leave Canaan fir roots mm -hmm. and the Korean fir top. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a little science. It little is. Science it experiment. Is. Yeah, yeah. You always have to have something else going on because, you know, things say, <laughs> wow, this has a really interesting leaf. Yeah, that's what an is oak. This? Um, really? It is. Quercus dentata pinnata fitta is the cultivar. Wow, that's gorgeous. And yeah, it's pretty neat. A big tree of that is pretty impressive. Wow. It doesn't get huge. Uh, it's a slow growing oak, but as it gets up there, it's pretty nice. These are going to a garden center on Martha's Vineyard. Wow. Really nice selections. There's some more of that marble chip. Oh, it's marble great chip. leaf. Mm. Well, here's some conifers that are ready to have their rootstock totally removed. Mm -hmm. The scions are big enough now, and we'll come in here probably in the next week or so and remove the rootstock, grow them for another couple weeks, mm -hmm. make sure they're stable, and then ship them out to the customer. And does this this stuff just get composted afterwards? Yeah. Yep. We That's have a large cool. compost pile in the back. Yeah, we'll I'd add imagine. To that and so forth. Here's that panita oh, fit yeah. in. <laughs> Where is this originally from, do you know? I don't. I don't know where it was It's got discovered. a nice texture to it. It and, is. It's yeah. thick, kind of leathery yeah. leaf. It's pretty cool. Yep. And then the ginkgos, of course, mm -hmm. are probably, a, I'd say, our second most popular genus. Do you sell a lot to urban areas as well? Like Yeah, yeah. Um, and what really folks love, we do a lot of the dwarf ones. So mm -hmm. people that have a small yard, small urban yard, mm -hmm. The dwarf ones are a way to get that great ginkgo leaf and the fall color in a small area. Mm. And so they're, we always make sure we have them on the truck when we go to a plant sale. Is this like a fringe tree or what it is, is this? Yeah. So this yeah. one, let's find the tag here. So this is a, a dwarf Native American fringe tree. Mm. Um, it's quite rare in the wild environment. I think it's actually protected. We got the scions off a garden specimen so that we weren't breaking any laws, taking it out in the wild kind of thing. But it's a fringe tree that stays very small. Mm. And it's kind of neat, so we're excited to start propagating that and get it out there in the world. This variegation looks gorgeous too. Yeah, that's a it's hedge papery. maple. It burns in full sun. It I was gonna say it's shade. so thin of, of yeah. a leaf. Yeah. Really pretty though. Yeah. It's oftentimes will have pink. That's another hedge maple. That yeah. one doesn't burn as bad. That one's called uh, pulverulentum, hmm. which means dusty. You can see it's speckled. Another horse chestnut. This time a little different variegated one. This yeah. one has a ruby red flower. And this one looks like it's crinkled, and more rugosa, like yeah, or something. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. This is a reticulated variegation one where the veins are dark, but the inner leaf is variegated. <laughs> Occasionally we get this, half the plant's oh, yeah. variegated, half isn't. <laughs> a little two-faced. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> and Japanese maples. And plenty. Lots of colors, textures, beautiful leaves. This is gorgeous. Is this a filigree lace? It might be. Yep. Yes, it is. Red filigree lace. It's like one of the more delicate looking ones. For sure. Yeah. For sure. The witch hazel grafts that are in the process for waiting to have their cutbacks done. Here's your favorite plant, Rosemary. <laughs> mm, just wiped up against that. Yeah, yeah. You saw it. Yeah, and all the witch hazels. I planted like seven, I think, recently in the landscape, like Beholden and a few others. Nice. Yeah. It's just so many different flower colors. There are. Yeah. I mean, yellow to purple and yeah. everything in between. And the funky beaches. beaches. Yeah. A lot of these are custom grafted for another nursery. Mm -hmm. They sent us the cyan wood. They had had a really dark leaf purple one mm -hmm. that they wanted done, plus the variegated leaf. And then this fern leaf one, too. Mm. And this is one of my favorite beaches, the Weeping Gold Beach. It needs afternoon shade, 
but you give it the right sight and it's a stunning wow. tree. Just beautiful. And fairly fast growing for a yellow leaf form. Yeah. Now we're into new grafts. We do one special grafting technique called uh, hot callus pipe grafting where we do the graft and then we'll heat only the graft union. The rest stays dormant and cold. The roots stay cold, the top stays cold. And so we'll heat just the graft union and get it to callus together, then move them to the greenhouse and let them grow out. And when you I mean heat it, what are you what are you using to heat it? Is it like electric heat tape? Really? Yeah. And okay. it's in an insulated tube and we lay the graft on the tube. The tube is kind of a U shape with a cable running through it. We lay yeah. the graft there and then pile sphagnum moss on top to insulate the top. Mm. And so we use that for all our oaks, witch hazels, beeches, and then anything else that might be a little difficult to propagate. It's a way to get them to form a stronger graft union before they actually start to grow. I'd never heard of that technique before, yeah. so that's really interesting. It's pretty and I know cool. oaks are, are also difficult, but like, I, I, I just, uh, not too long ago, I learned of somebody who's looking to do oaks and tissue culture. Ah, yeah, interesting. Which I thought was, you know, not everything takes to tissue culture. No, but, very true, yeah. for sure. Wow, look at this. Yeah. So this is a variegated red oak, our native wow. red oak. You ought to see this in the fall. It is spectacular yeah. with the, the leaf, fall leaf color with that white in there and it all summer long it's a strong show tree. Yeah, and I guess I should ask like even with the variegation like this stays then. It's like a, yeah. it's a stable variegation. This one is. Yeah. Some others are not. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some, especially variegated ginkgos, mm -hmm. are terrible. They're <laughs> like the most unstable plant in the world. <laughs> And we have an awful time getting them to keep their variegation. Is this a slower grower? You no. no. This wow. is very fast. Um, being a fresh graft, it probably won't grow much more this year. Yeah. But next year, if we put this in a bigger pot, it's going to be there easily. Wow. Yeah, it's really fast growing. And are you grafting that onto like regular red oak? Yeah. The oaks are very genus specific. Yeah. They A red oak does not like to go on anything else except the red oak. And it can't even go within the red oak family or not? Um, not most of the reds we work with. Yeah. There are some of the white oaks are a little more forgiving. They'll cross a cross species graft fairly easy, but the reds are not so much. This is a cool white oak, General Pulaski. I was going to say, is that like, it looks like it's eaten by something. It does. You know? it, it gets tall and narrow. It's yeah. almost columnar, but it has that really cool crinkly yeah. leaf. And how do you know that? Is that just how it grows? Or it, like, how I wouldn't know whether it's a virus or what. <laughs> I <you> know. know. <laughs> and sometimes it's like, all right, is the bug causing that? Yeah. What's going on? Yeah, here? I know. So it's, we'll inspect them real good when we see that. Right. Until we get to learn the cultivar and know its characteristics. We do sweet gums. Yeah, variegated sweet gums. Yeah. We got hemlocks over here. And these are more the weeping hemlocks, right? Some are. Some are, um, there's some larger growing gold forms. Mm -hmm. This one's really neat. Livingston. Mm -hmm. I think that's Livingston. Or maybe that's Moonfrost. It says Moonfrost, uh, yeah. Moonfrost's a nice variegated Livingston's one. right here. There you go. Yeah, Livingston's a real nice upright gold. Full-size grower, but yeah. bright gold leaves. We're very careful to make sure the hemlock woolly adelgid's not on a tree when we collect the scions. That's very good. We don't want to be Whoa, spreading Whoa, and look at these curve. oak leaves. Yeah, isn't that <gasps> cool? It's gigantic. You got, it looks like a big ruffled skirt. It does. And then some cornice. Yep. There's, is this the katsura again? It is, yeah. that's the uh, road fuchs, the red fox yep. katsura. I like that red fox. Yeah. Check that, <laughs> check that box. Dawn redwoods, we got some nice dwarf yeah. ones we work with. They're pretty exciting. They stay small where normally they're a big tree. 100, 100 feet. <laughs> Easy. <Boom. laughs> We're just starting into some magnolias. Mm. Started to pick up a few rare cultivars of that, so I'm kind of excited to see how they do. Of course, all so the here's ginkgos. your variegated There ginkgo. it is. Don't Our, bad mouth oh it. This one gosh. might just stay. Maybe, maybe that's the one. That, <laughs> maybe that's, that's the one. There. Yeah. I wish they would be stable. <laughs> <laughs> Such a challenge. This we're kind of excited about. So Don, who's our full-time her helper here, he's really into the larches. And that one came out of, I think, the Czech Republic. And um, those are three years old. 
only one of them put a branch out once. We cut it off and cut it into two pieces and grafted <laughs> it right away. But it just grows in this little tufted form. Yeah. I've seen pictures of it in Europe where it actually gets some size to yeah. it. It's really cool. Yeah. But we're going to be forever before we yeah. <laughs> have it in production. We're talking about fourth generation now. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> I'm dying to see your okay. your your hobby house. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> because we're a propagation nursery, all of the plants that we produce, we try to keep our parent plants here so that in case the source where we got the original mm -hmm. cyanwood from disappears, maybe mm. the gardener passes away and the right. family gets rid of the garden, or right. they lose the tree or something. And so a large percentage of our production space is actually taken up with parent plants. Mm. But today my helpers are out here um, putting out some trees that we brought out of the other houses where they overwinter mm -hmm. and putting them out where they'll spend the summer. There's more plants here than over there. Yeah, the yeah, it probably is. <laughs> bought this what tractor a great when I was tractor. Yep, bought well, it when I was 13. 13? Yeah. been with me a while. That's baby right there. That's my oh baby. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you were a baby when you bought it. Yeah, though. yeah. I bailed hay with it for a long time. <laughs> Man, most 13 year olds want like a little toy tractor. Yeah, no, a, no. No, Dad, is, I want a real I tractor. Want a tractor. Look at those wheels, too. It looks like they've been really they've, worn. They've been there a while. Yeah. <laughs> they need replacing. <laughs> wow. What a cool machine. But she's here every day working. So can't knock that. Amazing. <laughs> So Don and Chaz today, as I said, they're mostly putting out rootstocks. Mm -hmm. So some of the rootstocks, a lot of the grafting we saw earlier, we do down low. But occasionally we like to graft up high with something that weeps or maybe it's a dwarf like we did with this fur over here. Mm -hmm. And so we'll grow some of the rootstocks up to nice and tall, get some caliper on them, and then do the grafting up high. Is there any um, benefit to that, like uh, as far as like not root sprouting or something along those lines? Uh, not so much from the root sprouting. Okay. That would probably actually be a be little worse. worse. Yeah, because you're cutting it up so We've high. Got that makes all sense. that exposed rootstock. Yeah. But the species we do the top working to are species that don't tend to sucker. So I, see. I don't want to put something out there that the client's going to be, oh my gosh, this is a lot of work. So is this the example of like the, yeah. the coho but so you're growing it on like a standard. A standard, yeah. exactly. So that's the icebreaker fir mm -hmm. that we high grafted mm -hmm. one. And uh, we're gonna put those two either side. We're gonna have a retail office up here in probably a year or two. I'm gonna put it either side of the front door. That's cool. Kind of neat yeah. yeah. Do you, would you plant them in the ground or would you plant them in a pot? I think in the ground, yeah. just from a maintenance standpoint. I've already yeah. got enough plants to water and care yeah. for. <laughs> I don't think I need No more. shit, Ted. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> And all of the parent plants we have, we propagated ourselves. We yeah. don't buy those in either. So every plant we have on this nursery, we found in another garden mm -hmm. through the generosity of gardeners, other nurseries, and uh, folks that are just like, hey, you should grow this plant and get it out there. And yeah. So we'll get one or two going, and then from that we'll produce more and go mm -hmm. from there. How many different types of grafts do you do? You know? Kind of two or three basic types. Yeah. Um, we do a modified side veneer graft, and occasionally we'll do whip grafting. Mm -hmm. um, and then on the top working, I'll sometimes use a variation of those two. Yeah. But they don't vary it too much okay. because we're doing so many. We need something we can repeat and be good at. And, and that uh, what was it called? Hot callus. A hot callus, callus pipe. So that's you could do that with a whip graft. Yeah. You could do it without any kind of graft. Those. So it's exactly. like a, a style of like. It's like the after treatment. Yes. Okay. Kind of thing. The graft is still the same, but how we treated it before and after grafting is what's different for that. Okay, show me your pet plants. Okay, this is Don, by the way. Hi, Don. How are you doing? How many times have you tripped over this pipe working here? Not many. Really? That's, impre enough, yeah. that's impressive. <laughs> yeah. I did it once, I guess I wouldn't do it again. Now I'm always constantly <laughs> looking down. You know, there used to be where, where, the, where the hoop house is that has the, the natural ventilation now, or the greenhouse is, that was a hoop house, and that, yeah. had, that had a um, piping running through it. Yeah. And Ted even had a flag, and that one I used to trip <laughs> <laughs> When it's too obvious. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> oh my God, how do you get even airflow through this? I know it's outside, but it's like really packed in here. Yeah, it's a little tighter 
than I'd like. Yeah. But we're out of production space because we'll have where we were just walk through. It's empty right yeah. now, but in another couple weeks that'll be full. We have a lot of potting to do, and that new pottings will go in there. <clears throat> so because of that, we had to pack these in a little tighter than yeah. I'd like. But we'll come out here throughout the summer and rotate them, move them around a bit, and just make sure they've got good airflow and the foliage isn't getting shaded out. Do you ever get any bird's nests in here? All the time. <laughs> in fact, if we remember, there's a dove back in the other house. She's yeah. got eggs and a robin right in this house that has little babies. Oh. Yeah, we those can't be sold. Birds. That's those right. Yeah, sold. we we usually we flag them off. I only just discovered the doves, so I haven't <laughs> flagged it yet. Yeah, the birds love these houses. Yeah, oh, <laughs> this is a funky structure. Look at that. Is that a yeah, fir? Yeah, it's a fir. It That's might cool. Be a Nordman fir. Let's take a look what we got. That oh, is a cephalonica. A B that cephalonica. That is neat. Myers looking. dwarf. It's a it's low like, spreader. Yeah, and it looks like it has like. It, like an insect, like different segments, you it know? It does, yeah, I never thought of it that way. That's pretty neat. Some of the plants out here we're trying to discover, are they good enough for production? Mm -hmm. um, so we put them out here in just it's sort of a mock production situation and see, are these going to be garden worthy? Yep. But they will they survive nursery production as well? Yeah, so you're pressure testing them. Yeah, exactly. So that's a nice excuse. Right. <laughs> to, to, to warrant my collection. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> my problem. <laughs> <laughs> this is nice. This is almost like a filigree lace, but a little thicker. Yeah, it might be emerald lace. Emerald lace, yeah. It's gorgeous. It's very fast growing, real broad spreader. Hmm. It's pretty big. The <laughs> We have a running joke here, so if you've noticed the name tags that are yellow is mm -hmm. our indication it's a parent plant. Mm. The name tags that are white indicate it's available to sell. And then sometimes when they're younger, we'll just use yellow flagging ribbon around the block. We often threaten to just put yellow flagging ribbon across the driveway and say, nope, they're all ours, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> that would just mean you're out of business. Yeah, yeah there's a, a little problem there. <laughs> oh, look at that. That's oh. a double flowering American dogwood. Oh, just wow. coming into bloom. That's gorgeous. Yeah. It's interesting though because like the, I don't, when I think of dogwood, I don't think of like the flowers emerging well before the leaves. The American dogwoods do, but the Coosa dogwoods are June blooming, so they come out well after the mm. leaves. The Americans are kind of concurrently about the same time. <clears throat> I guess they're like an understory tree in the forest, right? Very so they much so, yeah. like their service like service berries, they yeah. wanna bloom, bloom quick, quick and, and I hear a robin yeah, in here. Probably got a nest on the other side. <laughs> There's almost always a cat bird at the end of this house that nests every I always, year. <laughs> I always like the their little muse. Yeah. Oh, nice apple tree. That's very oh, nice. Fragrance. And then is this a... Uh, what is this, a dutia? No, no. It's a, it's, so its common name is a little strange. It's double flowering almond, but it's not an almond. It's in the prunus family. Um, it's a dwarf shrub, gets about three feet by three feet, mm -hmm. and uh, then the pink pom-poms in the spring and a kind of a long, narrow leaf in the summertime. And I don't know where the almond part comes from on the name. Yeah. That's its common name. Huh. One of those things I'm gonna to have to look up someday. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> cool, and then you have a second house over there. Yeah, so that's pretty much more of the same. Yeah. Um, larger trees, um, some shrubs over there, and stuff waiting to go in the ground. As soon as we get a perimeter deer fence up, almost all of this is gonna go in the ground. Yeah, that makes sense. In the next video, we'll be learning how Ted grafts his ornamental trees and shrubs using a side veneer grafting technique. So stay tuned here. And if you're finding value in the videos we produce, we'd love for you to subscribe and hit the notifications button here on YouTube. We're committing 10% of our Google AdSense revenue back to projects in the Finger Lakes region. So your viewership is not only appreciated, but contributes to the community here. We'll see you in the next video.